Light out everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. And today I'm going to be diving into the very dark and disturbing case of a teenage killer by the name of Sean Sellers, who basically, at a young age, decided to sell his soul to the devil, so to speak, and invite the demons inside. This is a very controversial case because this is one of very few times that someone under the age of 18 has been put on death row for the crimes that they committed. There's also some controversy surrounding whether or not Sean struggled with mental health issues. But ultimately, to deal with the things going on in his life, he turned to occult subjects and black magic to fill the void. But before we get into today's episode, I wanted to remind you that we are running a Black Friday merch sale at MileHeartMerch.com. Right now, almost everything on the site is 25% off. This is the largest sale of the year, and we will not be restocking any of the items that you see on the site right now. So if you've been waiting to get some merch, now is the time to do it. Everything is heavily discounted. And I believe we still have almost all of the Lights Out designs available. So go check that out. We do ship worldwide and we ship for free to all 50 states with any order over $100 right now. Go check it out. It's a great way to support the show. Obviously, other ways to support the channel are subscribing on YouTube, subscribing on Apple Podcasts, and following us on social media at Lights Out Cast, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok much appreciated. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Skylight Frame and Higher Love Wellness. So let's just jump right into the life of Sean Sellers and see if we can figure out where things went wrong. So Sean Richard Sellers was born on May 18th, 1969 in Corcoran, California. His parents were Richard Sellers and Vonda Blackwell. They got married in Kings County, California just a year before Sean was born. His mother was only 16 at the time of his birth. His father was a talented artist, but suffered from alcoholism. He drank heavily and couldn't hold down a job. He also cheated on Vonda almost constantly. So by the time that Sean was three years old, his parents' marriage had fallen apart. After they got divorced, Sean moved with his mother back to her home state of Oklahoma. At this point, he barely knew his real father. His mother raised him alone for a few years and she worked full time in order to support the family. She often left Sean with other family members while she worked during the day. A few years later, Vonda met a man named Paul Bellafato. She hoped that Paul would be a strong father figure in Sean's life and hopefully they could make enough money to have a stable home life. Vonda and Paul got married in a small, simple ceremony not long after, and Paul became Sean's stepfather. But they rarely got along. Paul is known to be a strict disciplinarian. He was actually a former Green Beret, and he thought Sean was too sensitive. By the mid-1970s, an economic recession hit Oklahoma. Vonda had tried to be a stay-at-home mom for a bit, but she needed to go back to work. So she decided to join Paul by becoming his team truck driver. Since they both had to leave the house for work for weeks at a time, they took Sean to his grandparents' house. And while his parents were out on the road, he lived with his grandpa Jim and step-grandma, Geneva. His step-grandma thought that Sean was a needy child, and she struggled to take care of him. He did fine in school and he made friends, but his grandparents knew they couldn't take care of him long term. So by the third grade, his parents moved Sean out of his grandparents' house, and they moved back to California. Meanwhile, none of the adults in his life knew about a secret Sean was keeping. By the age of six, Sean claims he began hearing voices in his head. They were loud, shouting voices that constantly criticized everything he did. They were angry and controlling. But after a while, he thought these voices were normal. You just thought that? 
everyone must have these voices in their head. So he did his best to deal with them the best he could. And after moving back to California with his parents, Sean struggled connecting with people. He had made friends in school in Oklahoma, but after moving, he was the new kid with no friends. He was often lonely since his parents were usually out of the house. And the only person he really got to talk to was the local babysitter that watched him while his parents were out on the road. But Sean's parents didn't realize that the babysitter was actually bringing satanic books over to the house. And out of curiosity, he began reading through some of the books. At an early age, Sean read about demons, the occult lifestyle, and black magic. And his babysitter told him all about the rituals. Sean figured it would be a good idea to keep all this a secret from his parents. Meanwhile, the family still struggled with money. So at the start of fourth grade, his parents still worked as truckers and had signed on to another trucking line. And when Sean moved back in with Jim and Geneva, he had a whole new fascination with Satan. But still, he kept it a secret. He grew close to Jim and Geneva like they were his own parents. Jim could be strict and nearly abusive at times, but Sean liked living with them. Plus, he really didn't have a choice. In early 1979, though, Jim and Geneva separated, and even though Sean was close to them, he didn't seem too affected by it. He was just happy that he had made friends at school and didn't have to move again. His teachers knew him as a sweet, gentle young boy, and he loved to read, and he was a good student. When Vonda and Paul returned from their work trips, Vonda liked spending time with him. She saw him as a perfect child, but Paul didn't look at him the same way. He thought Sean was too soft and sensitive, and he wanted Sean to toughen up and be a real man. So when Sean was 10 years old, he took him hunting along with his uncle. The thought of killing an animal absolutely horrified Sean, but Paul thought it would toughen him up. While they were out in the woods, Paul gave him a rifle and told him he wasn't a man unless he pulled the trigger and killed an animal. Sean hesitated as he didn't want to kill an animal, but his stepdad and uncle kept pressuring him. And when Sean refused to participate, his stepdad and uncle would call him a wimp. They shamed him until he finally pulled the trigger. Sean quickly realized that shooting the animal wasn't even the worst part. After killing the deer, they showed Sean how to field dress and handle the body. They then tied the deer up by its hind legs and showed Sean how to cut off the deer's genitals and disembowel it. His uncle also showed young Sean how to decapitate a wounded raccoon by putting an axe on its head and pulling its hind legs until the head came off. After these hunting trips, the usual smile on Sean's face started to disappear. The voices in his head also grew louder to the point where Sean became paranoid. At home, he would take cloth thread and attach them to the doors to see if anything was coming through the doorway when he wasn't looking. He would also take a comb and brush the nap of the carpet in one direction before leaving his bedroom. This way, he could see if anything was entering his room while he wasn't there. His parents would leave Sean for days or even weeks when they had to work, and he either stayed with his relatives or a babysitter. His parents really just weren't around long enough to see the psychological effects it was having on him. The more his mom left him, the more he resented her. Sean eventually took one of his babysitter's books on the occult and Satan. The stories and passages intrigued him, and he began believing there was power and black magic beyond his wildest dreams. He kept the book hidden away, and he would read it when his parents weren't around. At night, he escaped into stories of black magic and power, and his fascination grew by the day. This was a way for him to escape the torment of life and not feel so alone. When his parents were gone, Sean would dive deep into occult ideologies. He found a connection to these books because they helped him feel connected to something. He felt like it was almost a security blanket for him. And the worse his life at home got, the more he wanted to sink into the books. He would often wet the bed even in his early teens. And if he ever wet the bed two days in a row, his uncle would make him wear spoiled diapers on his head in shame. Eventually, his mom and stepdad also began physically abusing him, 
and his only escape was diving into the books and fantasizing about the power he could have through black magic. The worse his home life got, the more his obsession grew. He felt like he was only in control of his life when he was closer to the occult lifestyle. In 1981, Sean became obsessed with the game Dungeons and Dragons when he was 12. It's a game that's heavily influenced by the player's imagination, and by the 1980s, a Dungeons and Dragons panic was spreading through the news. The panic started with a 16-year-old named James Egbert III, who disappeared from his dorm room at Michigan State University. He was an extremely intelligent kid who was seen as a child prodigy. He went to college early to study computer science. On August 5th, 1979, James wrote a suicide note and disappeared. His parents then hired a private investigator named William Deere, and William thought that their son had disappeared because James was into Dungeons and Dragons. When William released this information, the media caught wind, and a frenzy surrounded the game. The truth was James suffered from depression and drug addiction. He was also under serious pressure from his parents, and also struggled coming to terms with his sexuality. He had fled into the utility tunnels underneath the university during an extreme episode of self-harm, and this would later become known as the Steam Tunnel Incident. Down in the tunnels, he swallowed a large dose of a sedative, hoping to kill himself, but he ended up surviving. Then he fled to a friend's house and lived in several different places just outside the university for several weeks. Eventually, he took a bus down south to New Orleans. While there, he tried to kill himself with cyanide, but again he failed. After a few days, he eventually called the private investigator and gave up his location. William ended up picking him up in Louisiana and returned him home to Michigan. Sadly, a year later, James died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Even though the evidence pointed to his mental health and drug addiction problems, some activists started to believe that James' suicide was caused by his interest in Dungeons and Dragons. They thought that playing the game made James lose touch with reality. This became one of the first incidents to cause the widespread panic. Parents even began suing the game publishers when bad things happened to their children. A woman named Patricia Pulling suffered the loss of her son Irving when he shot himself in the chest and Patricia blamed her son's high school principal for putting a curse on him during a game. But she believed the curse had become real, and she claimed that it was a dangerous game of fantasy role-playing that had witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, suicide, insanity, demon summoning, sex perversion, and a whole list of other things that corrupted children. She then formed the Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons campaign And from there, she began campaigning against the game through conservative Christian outlets and mainstream media. She even had an appearance on a 60 Minutes episode. And after this, parents across the country became concerned about the game. So when Sean Seller's mom discovered that he was into Dungeons & Dragons, she sent him straight to church camp in 1982. Sean felt like church camp was just another way for his parents to control him. While there, he realized it wasn't all bad. He actually ended up falling in love with one of the girls there, or he thought he did, and he became obsessed over her. And he even made a pact with God, saying that he would do anything if God can make the girl love him back. But a year passed and the church camp ended, and the girl never did love Sean back. So Sean saw that God wasn't willing to give him the power and control that he wanted. So it was time to turn to the devil. In 1983, Sean and his parents moved to Greeley, Colorado. Crazy enough, I actually lived in Greeley, Colorado. Very, um, it's a small town north of Denver, about an hour or so. It's kind of a agricultural town. Smells like cows. We call it cow town because there's a big slaughterhouse there. And every week they slaughter you know, cows there, and it smells like absolute shit for the week. But at the time of their move, Sean was 14 years old. And every time he moved, he became less and less stable. Which I get this. 
from personal experience, actually have moved, God, probably like 13 times. And no, my parents were not in the military. Uh, they were both teachers, and they just kind of moved where the teaching jobs were, I guess. But uh, yeah, I definitely can relate to Sean in this sense that moving is very, very difficult, especially as a child, and having to go through making new friends over and over again and not being able to really gain deep friendships with anybody because you're just not around long enough to allow that to happen. I know at times, in especially my teenage years, I definitely felt like I was becoming less and less stable because my environment wasn't stable. I was constantly moving and you know, I went to three different high schools, so I definitely relate on that front. It's, it's very difficult. Sean barely had any friends, and if he made any new ones, he wouldn't be able to keep them because, again, he just moved around so much. By now, Sean was practicing occult rituals every day, and this was the only thing that he had control over in his life. His parents would leave him at home for days, all alone. And the more lonely he got, the more depressed he became. Until one day, Sean snuck into his parents' bedroom when they were gone. He opened their closet, and he took out his stepfather's revolver. He held the gun in his hand and stared at it for a long time while he thought about killing himself. His depression had gotten so bad, he began contemplating suicide often. After a moment, though, he returned the gun to the closet. And instead of killing himself that day, he decided to dig deeper into the occult. During his rituals, he started believing that evil was better than good. Throughout this episode, I'm going to be playing a few clips from an interview that Sean gave. So here's a clip of Sean talking about his interest in evil versus good, especially demons. When I first started my rituals and stuff, I began with the pentagram and with, you know, magic circles and stuff and different talismans in order to keep the demons away. I, as I got into more of this philosophy of good and evil being interchanged, I began to think of demons as my friends. And I began to see that I was mistreating them by doing this. So I began to invoke demons and ask them to enter my body. You know, I would say, this is a sanctuary for you. Please come in. And they would. So on top of inviting the demons in, Sean also started taking amphetamines to stay awake late in the night to perform the rituals. He also suffered severe mood swings. One moment he would feel euphoric, and the next he would feel suicidally depressed. He would often perform acts of self-mutilation, like cutting his arms and putting sharp objects into his scalp. Let's listen to Sean talk about the self-harm and blood sacrifices. I have a scar here where I cut myself in art class and I didn't, I didn't know what I was going, doing then. You know, I just, oh, well. And I just told a couple of days later that uh, I was cutting myself and licking the blood off my arm, freaking people out. Now I got that scar there. I remember doing that one. That was whenever I got my satanic name. That was where I sacrificed blood to Satan. As I uh, got deeper and deeper involved, I liked for this stuff to happen to me. I was not um, in any way, you know, rejecting it. You know, my blackouts, you know, whatever you want to call them, I liked it. I thought it was cool because I felt that I was controlling the demons and that uh, I knew what I was doing. And I wanted to be evil because I thought evil was good. I wanted to have power through Satanism and I thought that power was good. When Sean wasn't conjuring demons, he did have some hobbies that weren't so disturbing. In his spare time, he'd also become active in the Civil Air Patrol. He joined their program that focused on leadership, aerospace, fitness, and character. And by the end of 1983, he had become a cadet in the program. But no matter what kind of hobbies he picked up, his parents controlled almost his entire life. In 1984, his parents left on another big trucking trip, so they placed him in the care of his Aunt Debbie in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Again, he was torn away from the very few friends that he had made in Colorado, and his depression only got worse. While living with his aunt, he began sneaking alcohol into her house, and he got drunk whenever he could. He didn't bother trying to fit in at school because he figured his parents would, you know, move him once again. 
without a moment's notice. In his spare time, he would hide away in his room, read books, and perform occult rituals. Let's listen to Sean talk about how he got introduced to black magic. When I was about 10 years old, I had a babysitter who introduced me to the occult in the form of some books and stuff. At 13, I got involved in Dungeons and Dragons, and it became just an obsession with me. Then at 15, I uh, got introduced to a witch, and she took me in as her disciple and taught me for a while and got me involved in Satanism. It's interesting that he was introduced to this witch at such a young age, which I'm not even quite sure how he came about meeting this witch. But as a young teenager, I mean, which would you pick? White magic or black magic? I mean, at this point in his life, he's looking for powerful transformation. He's looking for powerful abilities. And black magic seems like the most logical way to do that. But by going that route, there's obviously a price you have to pay. And I don't think Sean fully realized what would happen to him if he started practicing black magic. With that being said, though, I want to clear up some of the differences between black magic and white magic, because there's a lot of misconceptions about it. If you look at magic online, obviously you're going to get references to black magic, references to white magic, and there's a lot of sites out there that promote black magic as this potentially potent form of magic while others warn against using it, portraying it as negative or harmful. Like you just heard in that interview, Sean mentioned that a witch introduced him to white and black magic. Now, some witches believe that there is both black magic and white magic. And for those that identify as a witch or consider themselves a Wiccan, they only practice white magic which again is beneficial and positive, causing no harm to any living being. And there's even some people out there who make the distinction between black witches and white witches. According to this concept, Wiccans fall into the white category, while those who choose to do harm with their magic are black magic. So that's, that's a very, very simple explanation of it, and I'm sure someone out there who is a Wiccan or you know, considers themselves a witch can enlighten me even further. But basically, black magic means you could potentially do harm to others, and there is potentially the risk of causing harm to a living being in order to do the spells, as opposed to white magic is more about introspection, positive healing, reinforcement, things like that. So very, very basic overview of that. So Obviously, at this point in his life, Sean is turning to black magic because he's, you know, he's, he's struggling with all of these things going on in his life. His life is kind of unstable. He's hearing voices in his head. He's praying to Satan. And black magic seems like potentially the way out for him. It's going to be the way to become a better, stronger version of himself, or so he thinks. But sure enough, it didn't take long for Sean to be moved again, and this time he returned to Colorado for the summer. By the end of the summer, his parents planned on sending him back to live with his aunt in Oklahoma again. In between the chaotic moves, he performed one more ritual in his bedroom. With the door closed, he took a blade and cut his wrist open, and as the blood poured out, he collected it into a glass jar. Then with a fountain pen, he used his blood to write out an oath to the devil. In this oath, he devoted his entire soul to Satan. By 1985, he moved back in with his aunt, and then back again with his parents. And by the time he turned 16 years old, Sean had moved 30 times. He had no sense of home, and the only consistent thing in his life were the rituals he was performing. The more nightly rituals he performed, the more he looked for proof that Satan was with him and giving him strength. He desperately got his hands on any satanic book he could find, and he wanted to learn more about all the demons and dark forces in the world. He also became obsessed with the biblical morals and how to challenge them. He stored vials of blood in the refrigerator, and he would actually bring it to school 
and drink it in front of his classmates. I was really into drinking blood and stuff. I'd gotten to the point where I even craved it, where if I didn't have, I had blood in these little bitty vials that I had taken from a clinic that I had worked at. And I used needles and stuff sometimes to draw my own blood because I didn't want the scars to appear. You know, my, you know, parents get kind of crazy whenever scars start appearing on your arms and stuff. So I hit it with, by using needles. I used, you know, got my friend's blood, uh, whatever I could find. And I kept it in these vials and I kept the vials with me all the time. As you can imagine, if you're pulling out vials of your own blood and drinking it, you can imagine what his classmates thought of him. Sean was even voted most likely to become a vampire at school. Around this time, he was reunited with an old childhood friend named Richard Howard. They'd actually known each other since they were kids, and they both had similar upbringings. Richard had been raised by his grandparents just like Sean was when he was little. And the more they saw each other, Sean realized that Richard was also into the occult lifestyle. Richard had a few other friends that he brought around. And while they were hanging out, Sean performed his first satanic baptism. He blessed his friends and welcomed them into a satanic church. They eventually built up a small gathering of eight people before conducting another ritual. Sean was actually arrested for trying to steal a black cloth from a department store, but the police only sent him home with a slap on the wrist. Sean also began drinking and doing drugs more often with his friends. And soon he dropped from his honor roll standing quit the few sports he was doing at school and stopped caring about his appearance. He then began painting his nails black, growing out his hair, and wearing black clothes. I wore a lot of black. I wore a black headband all the time. I had satanic jewelry. My fingernail on this uh, finger was about that long and filed to a point and I kept polishing on it a lot so that it would uh, be, you know, be hard. And uh, some of my other friends and stuff would, uh, you know, they would have these three fingernails grown long and pointed or just those two for the sign of Satan. His mom saw that he was changing so she forced him to attend a Bible study class. She thought the only way to help him was to force him into religious study but this only reinforced Sean's obsession with the occult. His rituals empowered him and made him feel free. It was also a great way to rebel against his mom. The rituals boosted his confidence and he felt like the devil was on his side. During his rituals, he would try to summon demons and get them to take control of him. He thought that if a demon possessed him, he could have more power. Here's Sean talking about wanting more power from Satan. I got to the point where I didn't care anymore. I didn't care about anybody else or anything else except myself, and I wanted to be powerful. You know, I wanted power. I wanted to be in control of others. I liked it when people were afraid of me. And a lot of people were. And for a good reason. I was dangerous. In Satanism, there comes a point that you have to give him everything. 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 Well, one of these demons that he invited to possess him was supposedly named Ezerate. And Sean truly believed that he had accepted this demon into his body. In demonology, Ezerate is known as a human that turned into a demon. She's a laid-back trickster, and when she was a young girl, her home village was attacked by a corrupted military. She and her brother were out in the woods nearby when the attack began. Both their parents died and the siblings got separated from one another. And when the attack ended, she went out looking for her brother. She ended up wandering into the house of a local scientist The man let her stay there for as long as she needed, but she needed to work for him. But during a freak accident, the scientist's lab exploded. Ezra died, but she returned as a demon. Her physical features changed, but she was able to look like a regular human when she wanted to. She grew a thin black tail that split into two prongs at the end, and the tips of her tail changed to bright red. Her blue eyes had changed to gray. And when she got angry, her eyes turned black and her pupils turned bright red. Her teeth, ears, and nails all became slightly pointed. When she became a demon, she could control blood using her hands. She could also control the limbs of humans or small creatures. When doing this, her fingers would look like she was playing the piano in midair. She also had the ability to pull blood from a wound and harden it to make it into a weapon. 
She now spends her time roaming the world forever searching for her brother, and Sean Sellers believed that he had accepted Ezerate into his own body. The holidays are right around the corner, and this is about the time of year where I start stressing about what I'm going to get everybody on my list. Well, today I'm here to tell you about Skylight Frames. Digital picture frames are by far the coolest gift you can get any of your friends, loved ones. I mean, this thing is absolutely amazing. What's cool about it is that you can update this digital frame from anywhere. Sending photos to Skylight is effortless. Everyone in the family can use the app or just email them to Skylight and they'll pop up in seconds. It only takes 60 seconds to set up. You just plug it in, you use the touchscreen to connect to your wireless network and enjoy. You can choose from two size options, either the original 10 inch or a new large 15 inch frame. You can preload it with photos, which is what I'm gonna do, and send it to my grandparents who, you know, aren't the most tech savvy, but this allows me to actually set it up from them and keep adding photos to it of my daughter so that they can see the great grandchild. Skylight Frames has a 100% satisfaction guaranteed, so if you don't love your Skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. So what's cool is now as a special offer, you can get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter code LIGHTS. That's right, to get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter code LIGHTS. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com, promo code lights at school sean's obsession with the occult finally caught up to him and he liked drawing attention to himself during biology class he wanted to shock the other students so he took one of the dead frogs they were going to dissect and tore off its legs with his teeth sean was thrilled when all the other students started gasping in a school essay he wrote that he finally felt free enough that he could kill without remorse one of his teachers called Sean's mother and told her about his essay. But by now, Sean barely had a relationship with his mom or stepdad. They didn't understand who he had become, and they couldn't control him or discipline him. And by this point, Sean really spent most of his time with his friend Richard. Sean eventually took over a small abandoned farmhouse at the edge of town where he and his friends performed all of their dark rituals. Soon Richard and Sean really became inseparable. They were like brothers, but they wanted to make it official. So during a ritual, Sean cut his skin open with a blade and poured blood into a chalice. He then handed the chalice to Richard and had him drink his blood. Sean then proceeded to drink Richard's blood. And after the ceremony was over, they felt like spiritual brothers. But this was a friendship that wouldn't end well for either of them. When they weren't obsessing over their rituals in the farmhouse, they were going around town getting into trouble. In early September of 1985, Sean and Richard went into a local Circle K gas station where they tried to buy beer. When they brought a six pack to the counter, the cashier, Robert Bauer, asked for ID. Sean tried to make excuses for why he didn't have his ID, but the cashier saw through his lies. So Robert kicked both of them out of the store. For whatever reason, this triggered something in Sean. He had felt the same way when his parents told him he couldn't do something. He felt oppressed. So when they got back to the abandoned farmhouse, Sean told Richard that he was going to get revenge on the Circle K store clerk. Richard felt the same way. And for the next week, they started making a plan. He told Richard it was time for them to prove their worth to the devil. They needed to make a human sacrifice so Satan would finally give them the power that they were looking for. Here's what Sean had to say about this. In the Satanic Bible, the copy I had, I think they have um, edited that out of it since then, but the copy that I had said that on the choice of a human sacrifice, that you would choose people who didn't give to society anything, didn't beg by their actions to be, you know, exterminated. So we did a ritual, a lust ritual one night, and we drove to the Circle K. In Sean's mind, he would become the most powerful man in the world. So to prove his loyalty, he needed to break the Ten Commandments which obviously one of the big ones is thou shall not kill. Sean and Richard even joked that they could just wait at a stop sign in the middle of nowhere and kill the first person to run that stop sign. They also considered torturing a friend's ex-girlfriend. They talked about fantasies of tying her down, raping her, slicing her breasts open, and cutting her throat. 
But in the end, Sean wanted to get revenge on the 32-year-old Circle K clerk, Robert Bauer. The weapon would be a 357 Magnum that Richard stole from his grandfather, and he gave it to Sean. And on September 8th, 1985, Sean and Richard rolled up to the local Circle K store in Oklahoma City. Supposedly, Richard amped him up before going inside. When Sean built up enough confidence, he and Richard walked into the Circle K. Once inside, they just acted like they were going to buy something. Robert stood behind the cash register with a coffee in his hand. Sean started talking to him while keeping the gun hidden. He made small talk to make Robert feel comfortable. There was no one else in the store and no security cameras, surprisingly. Finally, Sean pulled out the Magnum, raised it above the counter and aimed it at Robert, and pulled the trigger. A shot rang out, but the bullet missed Robert and went into the wall behind him. Robert then ducked behind the counter and ran towards the back door. Sean fired off another round that hit Robert in the leg. Richard then ran in front of Robert, blocking the doorway. He yelled at Sean to keep shooting. So at that point, Sean approached Robert, point blank, and fired again. Hollow point bullets had been loaded into the revolver. So when Sean shot Robert in the chest, the bullet splintered and broke apart, hitting his heart and lungs. His body was knocked back from the bullet's impact, and Robert collapsed to the ground, dead. A large blood splatter covered the wall behind him. After looking down at Robert's lifeless body for a moment, Sean and Richard quickly ran out of the store. At first, Sean felt empowered by the murder, but soon after, Sean remembered sitting in his pickup truck thinking about suicide and shooting himself in the head. He was hoping he could find his way to a new world and leave everything behind. He went through a mix of emotions, but later he appeared happy when he was around his friends. Meanwhile, the police had no witnesses and no solid evidence. The culprits hadn't taken any merchandise or money from the store, so they knew it wasn't a robbery. But they couldn't find a motive. So as far as Sean and Richard could tell, they had just gotten away with murder. After this, Sean became more popular among his close circle of friends. His confidence had grown after the murder, and a part of him felt like Satan had given him more power. He also got a job at a teenage nightclub in town, and one of the girls there, a 15-year-old known as Angel, noticed his confidence and became interested in him, and they soon started dating. Sean often invited Angel over to his parents' house, but eventually his parents refused to let him see her. Angel had dropped out of high school and chain-smoked cigarettes. So Sean's mother thought she was a bad influence on him. After constant arguing back and forth with her son, Vonda ended up banning Angel from the house. After this, Sean got so fed up with living at home that he packed up his things and left. He got a new job at a pizza place and continued going to school while staying at the abandoned farmhouse. After a while, he realized he couldn't provide for himself, so he eventually had to move back home with his parents. Out of concern and desperation, his mother wrote Sean a six-page letter. In it, she told him how much she loved him and how concerned she was for him. But it was already too late. The anger he had towards her had grown so much over the years, and now he only saw his mother as someone who constantly oppressed him. She didn't accept his lifestyle or his girlfriend, and Sean was at his breaking point. He felt like Vonda was constantly trying to ruin his life. So during one of his satanic rituals, he began believing it was now his mission to kill his very own mother. At 16 years old, Sean rejected his mother completely and began hatching a plan to murder her. At first, he found rat poison and put it in her morning coffee. After she took her first few sips, Sean waited patiently for her to die. But his first attempt didn't work. He thought she would immediately choke and die, but instead nothing happened. She either had a strong resistance to the poison, or Sean didn't put enough in her coffee. Either way, Sean realized he needed a new plan. On March 1st, 1986, Sean decided to go on a drug bender. He smoked weed and took enough speed to keep him awake for three days straight, and by the end of it he passed out from exhaustion and slept for a few hours. But when he woke up, he was ready to kill. He snuck into his parents' bedroom where he found his stepdad's 44 revolver, and on the night of March 4th, 1986, Sean waited for his parents to go to bed. Meanwhile, he performed one more dark ritual to summon a demon. He wanted Ezra to possess him and help murder his parents. He 
He knew that his stepdad, Paul, was a former Green Beret, and he feared that Paul would get in the way, so he'd have to kill him first. But his mother was his primary target. After the ritual was complete, he snuck into his parents' bedroom where he found them fast asleep. Let's listen to Sean explain the murders of his parents himself. In the night, I got up, and I don't know, I still don't really know where I got the gun, but I had my father's 44 revolver. And I walked into the bedroom. I was, I, I was just wearing the black underwear that I wore. When I, I wore, in you know, rituals and stuff, I wore a pair of black underwear, a black cape and hood and stuff, and I was wearing those, those underwear. I walked into my parents' bedroom, and I was, I remember I was looking down at them, and I raised the gun up and I pointed it at my father's head, and I squeezed the trigger, and then I immediately raised it to where my mother's head was and squeezed the trigger again, and her head raised up, and I fired a second one into her. After the murders, Sean rifled through drawers and threw some things around, hoping to make it look like a home robbery. As he tossed around the things in his house, the horror of his actions finally kicked in. In a panic, he ran over to Richard's place in the middle of the night, and he confessed everything. At first, Richard couldn't believe it, but Sean told him every detail, and Richard realized he wasn't lying. After inviting him inside, they started making a plan to cover up the murders. They decided that Richard would take the gun and hide it, and Richard would act as Sean's alibi for the night. Their plan was to tell the police that Sean had spent the entire night over at Richard's place. The next day, they returned to Sean's house and pretended like everything was normal. When Sean got inside, he ran to the sink and splashed water into his eyes to make it look like he had been crying. After this, he ran outside, screaming and yelling, acting like he had just found his parents dead. A neighbor came out to see what was going on, and when Sean told him what he had found... The neighbor ran back to his house to call 911. At first, everything seemed like it was going according to plan, but once police and investigators arrived, they noticed that Sean started acting weird. While they questioned him, they noticed he wasn't emotional. He had a blank stare and barely talked. The investigators noticed he wasn't acting like a person who had just found his parents murdered. So they brought Sean and Richard in for questioning. The police interview with Sean lasted for seven hours, but it didn't take long for police to realize that Sean was hiding something. Sean assumed that they wouldn't question him at all. He thought the police would start looking for a different suspect. As for Richard, he broke pretty quickly. When police interviewed him, he almost immediately told police what had happened. Not long after this, Sean confessed to murdering his parents. He even told police about killing Robert Bauer at the Circle K. With these confessions, they charged Sean and Richard with murder. But Richard was quick to agree to testify against Sean. Since Richard cooperated, they dropped the murder charges against him. Instead, he got a five-year deferred sentence for being an accessory after the fact in all three murders. As for Sean, he pled not guilty. He claimed that he practiced Satanism at the time of the murders and demonic possession forced him to kill his victims. His attorneys also claimed that Sean was addicted to Dungeons and Dragons, which empowered his fantasies. But the jury refused to believe either of these claims. In 1986, Oklahoma law didn't give juries the option of giving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. One juror later said that they had discussed Sean possibly being paroled in 7 to 14 years after a life conviction, but many of them didn't think that that prison term was long enough. So the jury opted for the death penalty instead. When the trial was over, Sean Sellers was convicted of his crimes. The court then sentenced him to death, and Sean became the youngest inmate on Oklahoma's death row. Since we've now entered the holiday season, I don't know about you, but I find my stress levels rising. There's a lot going on, family, friends, gifts, dinners, so much to stress you out. Well, I'm here today to tell you about a product that is 100% natural that will be sure to help take some of the edge off this holiday season. And that is my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness. If you've never tried CBD before, or maybe don't know what it is, CBD is a cannabinoid that's extracted from the hemp plant. Now, CBD 
in the United States is 100% legal in all 50 states. And most of my CBD products contain no THC. So you don't have to worry about failing a drug test or getting caught with it and having to explain that, oh, it's a CBD hemp product. No worries. Almost all of my products are THC free, which also means that there is no psychoactive component to it. It's not going to get you high. It's not going to make you feel funny. It's just going to take the edge off is the best way that I like to explain it. CBD is a great daily supplement. You can take it in the morning, the middle of the day, at night, at work, and it's just gonna allow you to just be more peaceful throughout the day. If you haven't tried my CBD products yet, now is the time. I'm running my Black Friday sale right now through November 30th. I carry a wide variety of different CBD products, including CBD gummies, CBD oil tinctures, I carry CBD topicals, and CBD concentrates, which include vape pens and dab pens. I've also got CBD for pets. And again, I ship to all 50 states, including the UK and Australia and a few other countries as well. So check it out. Now's the time. Black Friday sale running through November 30th. That's higherlovewellness.com. While Sean was on death row awaiting his execution, he decided to turn away from his occult lifestyle and instead convert to Christianity. Some of his friends started a website for him and they claim that he should have been given clemency because of his religious conversion and how young he was at the time. He was only 16 years old at the time of the murders, but he had been given a death sentence which stirred up a lot of controversy. While he sat on death row, he campaigned for a change in his sentence. He actually made appearances on the Oprah Winfrey show in a segment on the show Geraldo to take responsibility and help people understand what he was going through. One of Sean's step siblings came out and said that they didn't necessarily believe that Sean's conversion to Christianity was sincere. And only one of his family members, actually his step grandfather, thought he was being honest. While in prison, he got a small following of people who thought he was innocent. On Valentine's Day, 1995, Sean married a woman while still behind bars, but the marriage was annulled two years later. While he stayed in prison for years, he tried to appeal his conviction. During his appeal in 1999, Sean told the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals that he had been suffering from severe mental illness during his crimes. Some of the psychiatrists who examined him said that the brutal abuse he suffered as a child might have led to a multiple personality disorder. Some also said that he had killed his victims during one of several psychotic episodes. Sean told the court that he had invited demons into his body. He said he heard voices in his head that told him to do things like shoot up his class and kill everyone. At first he said he thought it was cool, and then he got to a point where he was losing touch with his emotions. He couldn't feel anything anymore. He couldn't cry, and he just felt empty inside. It was discovered that in 1992, which was six years after his trial, Sean had been diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. Now it's called Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's a disorder where a person feels like they're switching between alternate identities. Sometimes they can feel the presence of two or more people talking or living inside their head at a time. And they might feel like they're possessed by these identities. A team of mental health professionals determined that Sean had at least three alternate personalities and sometimes as many as eight. In March of 1987, he had been examined by another psychiatrist and she claimed that he was chronically psychotic and exhibited symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia and other major mood disorders. She described how he was out of touch with reality and overwhelmed by fantasy. And during the appeals, his attorneys claimed that the person facing the death sentence for three murders was not the person who committed the crimes. But at the time, the justice system's view on mental illness was very vague. The prosecutor also argued that this was all just an attempt to escape the death penalty. It had been six years after his trial when he was diagnosed with this multiple personality disorder, so the skeptics thought that he might have manufactured the disorder over the years. During the appeals process, the courts acknowledged the neurological and psychological evidence, but they couldn't conclude that this would have changed the jury's vote to convict. Sean's appeal actually went all the way up to the Supreme Court in November 1998, but they refused to hear Sean's final appeal. The Attorney General immediately asked the State Court of Criminal Appeals to set an execution date, and so they did. 
There was controversy and outrage over Sean's death sentence, not just because he suffered from mental illness, but because he was only 16 at the time of the crimes. Sean ended up spending his entire adult life on death row. For his last years, he had been incarcerated in the H unit, a maximum security unit inside Oklahoma State Penitentiary. And he was one of the first prisoners to move there when the unit opened in November of 1991. According to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, they believed U.S. officials had kept Sean in dehumanizing conditions for most of his adult life. It's reported that no incidents appeared on his record while in prison, and he was seen as a model prisoner. In his final years on death row, he became very religious and took up hobbies like writing and artwork. He spent his time working on videos where he talked about the dangers of cults, Satanism, and drugs. But by 1998, all of his appeals were exhausted. Executive clemency was his last option. But Governor Keating reportedly said that he would never give Sean clemency. So on February 4th, 1999, Sean Sellers had his last meal. It said that he had Chinese food, egg rolls, sweet and sour shrimp, and some tempura shrimp. And he began his final statement by addressing his step-siblings. All the people who are hating me right now are here waiting to see me die. When you wake up in the morning, you aren't going to feel any different. This statement enraged all of his step-siblings. Sean then said, I love you all. In the final minutes before Sean would receive his lethal injection, he sang modern Christian music. Then he said loudly, Here I come, Father. I'm coming home. At that point, he turned to the warden and said, Let's do it, Gary. Let's get it on. Finally, he sang his last words, Set my spirit free that I might praise thee. Set my spirit free that I might worship thee. And at 12.17 a.m., five minutes after the drugs were injected, Sean died by lethal injection. So like I said at the beginning of this episode, this case was extremely controversial. Sean is one of 22 people in the United States since 1976 when the death penalty was reinstated to be executed for a crime committed while under the age of 18. He is also the only one to have been executed for committing a crime under the age of 17. The case of Sean Sellers drew worldwide attention because of his age, his religious conversion, and his claims that demonic possession forced him to kill his victims, which to this day, people still argue whether he was truly responsible for his crimes. Some say mental illness was to blame, and some even believe Sean was truly possessed by a demonic force. Either way, Sean's horrific actions left four people dead, which included himself. Nearly six years after his execution, the Supreme Court ruled in 2005 that it was unconstitutional to execute an individual for a crime committed under the age of 18. So with all that being said, what do you believe about Sean Sellers? Do you believe that he should have been executed for his crimes? Do you believe that he was really demonically possessed? Or was his mental illness the true root cause of many of his actions? Before I give you my personal thoughts on those questions, I just want to take a minute and remember the victim's of these horrific crimes. There is absolutely no reason for Sean to go out and murder not only his parents, but Robert at the gas station. I think ultimately there are many things at play here. This is a multi-layered issue, starting with the mental illness. And it was crazy because they truly believe that Sean had started acting mentally ill once he had been arrested, once he had been you know, they had put these crimes on him and he knew he was going to be facing the death penalty. There's a lot of people that believed he started acting mentally ill to try and sort of get out of the consequences. I think in Sean's case, what we have is the perfect storm. We have mental illness. We have filling your head at a young age with dark ideologies, fascination with the devil, evil, 
demons. And then obviously growing up in an abusive home, the just pure unstableness of his life. I think all of these things factored in to Sean carrying out the crimes that he did. It's a very difficult one. It's highly debated whether or not he deserved the death penalty. And, and it's one of those I go back and forth on when you're 16 years old. I mean, you're still, still essentially a kid. And at that point, if you do commit horrific crimes, is your, is your life over at that point? Is there any purpose to keeping someone alive after they've done such horrific things? And, and it's very difficult for me. I, I go back and forth with Sean. I'm like, I mean, he ended up seeming from his interviews and from what people said, he was a model prisoner. He ended up kind of turning his life around once in prison and ultimately did he deserve to be executed? I don't know. But then there's kids that carry out mass shootings at schools. And I'm just like, what's the point? This kid is clearly past the point of being helped in my opinion should they face the death penalty versus spending the rest of their life in prison. It's difficult because some people say spending the rest of your life in a maximum security prison is way worse than just executing them. So, I don't know. I'm very torn. With Sean, though, I don't necessarily think that he deserved to be executed, but even though Sean was just 16 or 17 years old, I think he probably had to know what the consequences were for his actions. But I don't know, man. It's it's very, very difficult. I go back and forth on it. I think it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but I want to know what you think. Do you think Sean deserved to be executed for his crimes, or do you think he deserved to get life in prison without the possibility of parole? I want to know what you think about this one. It's a very tragic case all the way around. With that being said, I'm going to go on and wrap up today's episode there. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. Until next time, Lights Out, everybody.